1977, Camp Scott was made up of 410 acres. It was divided into 10 units, each named after an Indian tribe. 27 little girls were a unit. It was near dense woods at the westernmost boundary of the camp. A drawing used at the trial some two years later shows the configuration of the Kiowa unit. The little girls' bodies had been carried from their tent and placed approximately 100 yards away. Two were still in their sleeping bags, one was not. All had been sexually assaulted before their murder. Pete Weaver was sheriff of Mays County in 1977. He arrived at Camp Scott at 7.05 a.m. And at that time, one of the victims, body I would, would estimate to be 70 degrees, was still warm. The other two were in sleeping bags, and which had some protection from the elements. And from there, we started our investigation. It had rained the evening before the murders, just after the little girls had arrived at camp and had continued into the night. Sheriff Weaver says the rain helped authorities estimate the time of the deaths. I found a uh, hank of sash cord that out by in that general area that uh, was dry, other than dew. So this would indicate that the crime was committed sometime after 11 o'clock, or that sash card was put there after 11 o'clock, because it had not been rained on. While law officers searched for leads, Mrs. Farmer, Lori's mother, learned that there had been other incidents at the camp prior to the night of the murders. And Mrs. Farmer says, had she known, she would never have allowed her daughter to go to camp. And it upsets her even today. If I had known a tent had been slashed, the night before Lori was to get on the bus to go, I would have never let her go. And when we got up there and saw the arrangement of the area, it um, is not the way we thought our child was going to be in a camp area. I would not have stayed in the tent Lori was in as an adult. I would not have stayed there. I would have been frightened. And as a, a parent of a child who was murdered, the hardest thing for me is to accept that I let her go into that situation. And I will never get over that guilt, ever. Meanwhile, investigators put their clues together, including a flashlight left at the scene which had a dated newspaper wrapped around the batteries inside, and particles from the attacker's hair found on the tape used to bind the little girls. Their evidence led investigators to believe that an escaped convict named Jean Leroy Hart was their chief suspect. Hart was a convicted kidnapper and rapist who had grown up in the area and who had been a fugitive for the past four years. Jerry Weber, Channel 2 News. Hart knew well the wooded countryside of eastern Oklahoma. He had hunted and fished the area all of his life, and he was related to many of the Indian people who live in the region. And among them, it was said that Hart was counseled by a powerful medicine man who had given him the ability to turn himself into a cat or a bird to help him escape his captors. This is beautiful country. It is also rugged country. The hills roll, the oak and blackjack are thick. And a man who knows the terrain can lose himself in here almost forever. Dogs were brought in from a police department in Pennsylvania to help in the search. A plane with a heat-seeking device was also employed, looking for Jean Leroy Hart and or his hideout. Uh, we had gotten information from a rel very reliable source that they were living in a cave. There were two of them that were living in a cave down in that area. And they say they stay at some friend's house until a police car comes by and they hit the brush and go up on this hill to a cave. Well, we searched this uh, at least three times and we could not find a cave. One time we could, could smell smoke, but we couldn't locate where it was coming from. Well, what this informant didn't know was they were going across this hill and across a hollow to the next hill. That's where the cave was located. We were looking in the general area, but we didn't have it, couldn't, couldn't find where the cave was at. Mm -hmm. And these is where the items are located from this camp. 
The cave Sheriff Weaver was looking for was accidentally found by W.R. Thompson, who lived nearby. He and his brother-in-law were out squirrel hunting when they stumbled upon it. Jean Leroy Hart was not there, but evidence was, evidence that would later be used at the Hart trial. And we found uh, what looked like where someone had been, been staying is what it was. There was a, a sack of flour. It's what really, it was in a bread sack is what it was. And uh, we, we picked it up, you know, and just curious. And I, we got to discussing, you know, if maybe it was something to do with this Girl Scout deal. And we decided, you know, we'd go up there and talk to him. And when we went back down there, when we found, well, there's pennies and uh, glass uh, for uh, glasses, you know, a case for glasses and some photos. And I see, some, there was some newspaper there. Now, at the time, you felt like it was pretty strong evidence. Uh, yes, so I, I really did. Now, you because, testified in the trial. Yes, I did. And at that time, you felt I, that Gene was... I definitely, you know, felt that he was, but now I don't. Meanwhile, the search for Hart pressed on from Mays County through Cherokee County on down into Sequoia and Adair counties, a landscape that over the years had hidden outlaws from Pretty Boy Floyd to Bell Star. Finally... After almost 11 months of looking, the manhunt bore fruit. These are the Cookson Hills, south of Tahlequah. This is where the long search ended, where Jean Leroy Hart was captured, living with an elderly Cherokee man named Sam Pigeon, who knew Hart as Drum. Hart was wearing a tank top and cutoffs when he was arrested and had gained some 40 pounds. The little girl scouts had been dead for nearly a year by the time he was tracked down. Jerry Weber, Channel 2 News.